Okay, so I'm going to talk about kind of what brought me to Toronto was grad school at OCAD. And this was essentially my thesis. Let me get a feel for the room. How many people uh, have used or heard of Arduino? So, yeah, XP's processing. Okay. Okay. So before I get started, I want to say that I'm interested in things that juxtapose each other. So I'm interested in this idea of cultural intangibles, looking at performance art that has a lot of tradition in it and how we can remediate that through new media tech. Um, this word I made up, uh, playformance, anytime you're dealing with um, any kind of experimentation in art, especially if you're using tech, especially if you're using technology that reads live data from the body, you're playing, you're making things up as you go along, you don't know what's going to happen, you're giving it a shot. That's where the play comes in. The undirected meaning making you can make through interactive tech. What do I mean by interactive tech? Interactive tech for me in this context is anything that can read live data from the body, kinetic movement, digitize it into zeros and ones. Once you do that, you can do anything with it. You can make a servo turn off and on, you can change the hue of a projection, do VJing, sound filters, DJing. I'm going to talk about a few of the projects that I've played with and then what's coming up next. Oh yeah, this. So th this is just something I kind of came up today. So I was walking down the street and I see people talking to themselves. You know, when you see somebody kind of, they have like an expression on their face and they're in a conversation with themselves and it's kind of weird. And the only reason I saw that is because I was having a conversation with myself and I looked up and I saw somebody else was doing the same thing. The reason I'm bringing this up is that when I use technology in a live event with a performer, I'm never trying to say that what I'm doing is, in, is improving what they were already doing. It's all about augmentation. I, took a, I take a look at what they're already doing on their own and I think of how can I use subtle technologies to enhance the performance or look at it in a different way so they can have a different approach to how they um, you know, do their craft. So when I saw those people on the street, I immediately thought about this scene from her. Right, look at those people talking to themselves. Uh, I thought about that because it's like, that movie I'm a big fan of, uh, and people responded to it so well because they were able to take a look at how technology can be added to or remediate something that we already do. That's the stuff that matters. Those are the concepts that people remember. Those are the things that don't end up being gimmicky. Like a lot of stuff you might see at something like Nui Blanc would be hand-waving. People are into it for two minutes and then they don't care about it. That's what a lot of the sensor art ends up being because it's gimmicky, right? Oh, there's my two. So the key is, right, is how to create meaning with the interaction. You shouldn't just be doing something because it's, um, because there's some little sensor in it and you know probably most people don't even know what that is. They, they're wondering how it works. You could do that for a little bit, but almost immediately, you're gonna find that one person or two people in the crowd, it's like, that's hacky. There's nothing there that hasn't been done before. The, the key is wrapping it in context. So I'm gonna talk about that. Yeah, okay. So a lot of these are from my thesis. I haven't looked at them in a while, but let's see. Okay, so the first step, so when I'm looking at building a network performance. So what does that mean? A network performance is that you got a human on stage doing his thing, he's dancing, he's rapping, he's doing something, and he's moving on stage, obviously, right? So I take a look at the type of movements they're doing, and I take a look at how can I create an output that makes sense for what they're doing? How can I create um, an extension of the body through technology and extend the senses? create a metaphor for what they're doing and um, yeah. So I take a look at 
what's already happening out there. I take a look at it, I go to different events, I get inspired by it, and then I come up with an idea. See, look at that. Idea comes before the tech. That's key, and that's something I've been learning the hard way. Because you get excited about some new sensor that comes out, or, or um, a communication that's quicker between two points. Of course, that's natural. But you have to first take a look at what you want to do with that artist that's already doing his thing, and how to add to it. So you think about the concept, then you think about what technology you can use. Now, one of the most important things about the stuff that I do is I really don't give that much, I don't really care too much about tech. It's not about technology. Technology is just a tool. What I'm more interested in is the idea of magic. I like to hide technology in costumes. I like to hide it in wood. You're going to see that in my projects. It's an ongoing theme. Unless I'm doing it ironically. Like if I'm doing some crazy cyborg and some of the wires are popping out but they don't do anything, that's different. That's part of the concept. But generally speaking, I'm more interested in the idea of magic than I ever will be in technology. Okay, so then I see what they're up to. I think, okay, I got an idea. These are the tools that can make it happen. I interpret the performer through my own lens because you have to add something to it. And then this is the, this is the part will, that will make or break you, this little trinity, right? You're prototyping compliance design. What I mean by that is I don't mean the, the standard definition of it. What I mean by that is an input-output relationship. The hardest thing about this kind of stuff is what does what and how much of it does it do? Is it a meaningful interaction? Can people get that it's a live input that's making those movements happen? Set design. Rehearsals, rehearsals, and you keep doing that, you keep doing that until you run out of time, and then there's the, there's the event. Next thing, of course, you document it for any artsy person. You have to document everything, because then how are you going to get that next grant? If you didn't record it, it didn't happen. Clearly, I come from a video background, so that's always something key for me. And then, none of this means anything if you don't reflect on it. So you go back and critique your idea, you go back and critique the tech. And you always ask yourself, why couldn't I have just had my VJ or DJ in the back pressing a button like they do in theater? You know, Did it really have to be a live input? And you have to be honest with yourself about that. And it helps you to critique your own ideas and make a performance that much more engaging. OK, so this Venn diagram, yeah. Okay, so a network performance is what I'm talking about. There's a feedback loop. Something is happening that's triggering something else and it's going right back to the person that actuated it. Comes in three kind of, and this is all kind of stuff that is my view on it. So you got the performance art, you got a poet, a storyteller, the traditional stuff, a human on a stage, that's all you need. Then you got the tech, leap motion, XP. Then you got creative direction, where I come in. I take a look at these two very different worlds and the more different they are from each other, the more interesting my job is. And I take a look at where they intersect. So the performance and the technology, they intersect by looking at interaction design, essentially UX design. Because if you're building something for a performance artist, that's exactly what that is. The idea and the art, the development of the concept, and then you're taking a look at the tech and the creative direction is compliance design, the input-output relationship, the difference between this guy up here and this here is that this is centered around the viewpoint of the director, usually me, and then up there is centered around the user. Yeah, so that's in a nutshell. And every time I say it, I say it in a different way and I learn something new about it. Okay, so this was, yeah, so conceptual development, one of the first steps. This was a still from a show we did in Dubai. Um, I'll show you a bit of video from the first time we did that project. Um, this was a, does anybody know what Sufi whirling is? Sufism? Yeah. Some, it's, it's the mystic side of Islam. There's a physical meditation that happens. Um, uh, and essentially you have a whirler whirling around. And it, 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 it's, it's really beautiful. The, the background of it is that it's, it's an attempt to be closer to the divine. It's a shamanistic performance. When I saw that, uh, I've known about it for a while, but re very recently, like two years ago, when I started to learn more about Arduino and sensors of what I could do with this stuff, it made perfect sense for me to put a gyroscope on one. 
I'll show you how that looked. Prototyping is so key. So a really good tool for me has always been the Leap Motion to do simple prototypes because it doesn't take that long to get it up. And you move it around and you can, you can check the leg on your visual output. And it's a really good way for your performance artist, usually somebody who doesn't even have a smartphone, it's like a flip phone. So you got it, it's a really easy and simple way for them to get used to and get comfortable with the technology. One of the biggest challenges is finding, because what you're doing is that you're putting something new and weird to somebody on stage who's more of the traditional type. They're naturally gonna be scared of it and they're naturally gonna be like, oh, this is live data, is it gonna fuck up when I'm on stage? It might, but you have to make them feel comfortable enough to wanna take that risk. So this is a very slow process and you gotta go at the pace of the people you're working with. This was at a talk I did at Seagraph a few years ago. Um, face Shift, yeah, Face Shift was a company there and I was playing around with different facial gesture recognition and moving around a 3D head. I eventually ended up being part of a team that did a play where that was you that was used for Harbor Front Center about two summers ago. That was called Faster Than Night. That was a really cool production, but super, uh, man, that was a hard one. When you're working with output that's video, live, you, you have to think about compression and you have to think about lag, because if people see drop frames, that's a shitty thing. People are much more, um, Forgiving with sound. That's something I learned. Okay, so yeah, more shots of prototyping. You got everybody's friend, Theo, there, uh, XP and gyroscope. This is one of my favorite sensors. I love the different things you can do with a gyroscope. Um, as you can see, I always like to hide the technology in costume. These are some of the shows we did. Uh, this is so a while ago now. This was maybe two years ago. This was the Sufi one, and then I did it again in Dubai. This was the most recent one, it was for Summerworks. I've always, I'm interested in doing things that I've never really been done before. Uh, and nobody has ever done Capoeira and wearable tech. I'm gonna show you a little bit of that and what that interaction looked like. That was at Summerworks in August. And I got a lot of good press, we got that on the Creators Project. And then the Sufi one too was up there. Oh yeah, so I was talking to somebody here, so I'm talking about um, you could do something with a DJ. Well, I did that. I did it with a Leap Motion back when Leap Motion was more exciting than it is now. Uh, people weren't that used to it. And this was very simple. It was, I, I had to use two Leap Motions because one was affecting the VJ and the other one was handling the sound filters and tractor. Uh, that was really fun. What's funny about this one though is that this guy is a DJ, electronic DJ, pretty well known, but he he liked the interaction too much and he just kept playing with it. So we mapped, like, I don't remember, it was probably reverb, delay, echo, I, uh, X, Y, and Z axis. And he liked it so much that he ended up just kind of going into his own little space. And he stopped being a DJ and became more of a soundscape artist. Um, so it was a very different kind of sound. Um, that was a really good learning experience. This was one of my earlier stuff. Here's an example of what I mean by compliance design. I'm going to show you this, and then I'm going to show you the video of the Sufi show, uh, just to tell you how important it is input, output, and how they interact. So there's three things that are happening in this show. First of all, you have lateral movements of the torso. That's happening with a connect, because what a connect can do is it can get absolute values, right? So this, this is zero, that's plus 100, that's negative 100. Uh, and I map that to the x-axis of a sphere. So the sphere follows the dancer. The rotation of the torso, the faster she whirls, the, the bigger the sphere would get. That's relative data, so that's what the sensor will do. That's what she's wearing, that's the wearable tech part. Technician key press, of course, just like in theater, sometimes there's times where you need to change what the same movement does from act one to act two, and you do that with a key press and processing. Uh, Wizard of Oz effect. Um, that, so it's kind of like the marriage between art and design, because art would be the live data stuff, and that is spontaneous, you don't exactly know what it's gonna do, you, you create parameters, but you didn't know to the degree to, to, to which it would react. 
And then the design part is when you put all these little pieces of live data into a sequence to help build a story. And you do that with key presses and sequences. Um, one of the things that I don't really like about um, a lot of this kind of techie art stuff is that it gets a bit too abstract for me and it doesn't have much of a story and it's just kind of vague. So that's why I like to build a story between what's happening and what's happening and what's happening. Now, those are the kind of shows that I'm into, things that have, uh, they don't necessarily have to have an ending, but they have to have some sort of progression. Um, so that's where the key presses are key. Okay, so this is the first time we did this on the so. I can barely see it. Okay, so that's just, that's a front projection. There's a connect pointing at her. She's got the gyroscope on the small of her back. It's talking to the MacBook with an XP, which is a radio module. So yeah, so quite simple really. The sphere is following her left and right from the connect. Right now the gyroscope's off. And you'll see why, because once you turn it on, the sphere will start to jitter. And our cue for her to turn it on is that she moves her shoulders around a little bit. So why a sphere, right? Because in Rumi's poetry, when he's talking about this kind of ritual, is that he's always describing the divine in cosmos, planetary bodies. So if the whirling, if the lightheadedness you feel from whirling around, to be closer to the divine, then it's kind of like you take one step towards God, God takes one step towards you. So we were trying to kind of build that relationship between kind of like the human and the virtual, but the virtual is kind of like an emanation of the divine, kind of like this idea of like the ghost in the shell, you know, if you, if technology is magic, then, then you can say that, you know, it's, it's the spirit, it's, it's the, the, the screen on stage is the portal to the inner uh, self of the, of the um, performer. So you can see there, one of the learning curves we had was that, uh, you see how when she would slow down, the sphere would kind of jitter? We had a really hard time smoothing out the data. Since I'm telling you that because we fixed it. If we hadn't fixed it, I probably wouldn't have told you. But we did it again in Dubai and we fixed that problem. Um, and we were interested to take that. It was kind of like Tron lights the EL wire and put it on the dancer so make the costume light up too. And that reacted to the, uh, the sensor as well. We took the connect out. Uh, we really didn't need it. We just stuck with the gyro. We did two shows there and we did two different colors. Uh, that was a really fun experience. Um, yeah, so that was one of my favorite shows we did, that set. Okay, so Mirada. Okay, so Mirada, this was my thesis uh, exhibition for at OCAD. I'm going to play this little trailer. I got bored with staged works. I got bored with stage works and I wanted to do an installation where the user and the audience is the same person. So I, I was super excited by that Tupac hologram and I was like, how did they do that? I want to I wanted do that. I did some research and it's a pretty much a very simple Pepper's Ghost effect, which is essentially reflected light. I did, for my thesis show, I didn't want to do a lame screen with a projector. I wanted to do something kind of like a volumetric display. That's what this ended up being like. And I picked the fire because, you know, our first technology, meaning making around the fire, four wooden objects that I made in Nicaragua. Each one of them has a unique sensor in it. So accelerometer, obvious choice, like a maraca. Uh, that changes, those little white specks of the fire, kind of like moss, they spread out and it creates a delay effect in the track. So there's always two outputs from this one input, visual and audio. We made that fire in processing. It was simple uh, eclipses that are being birthed there, moving up. This was a simple contact mic, fire more opaque.
hit kind of creates that kind of puddle sound. And the idea was that in each object is embedded with the soul of a dead friend. The, the story of this installation was called My Dead Friends. Capacitance, using your body as the ground. Um, and each of the wooden objects are designed in a certain way to invite a certain interaction. This idea of like implicit design where I hate this kind of idea you have an installation and you got to tell people how to use it. The good kind of installation is that people intuitively know what they need to do. So, and then, again, my favorite one is a gyro. Oh, I like that so much. We kind of made it like an abstract yoke of a plane, you know, so you hover it around. We, attract, we attach that to reverb. So this is also part of, part of it, because, because if the fire is the stage, then the audience and the, and the user are the same person. I really love the way when people try to figure out how it works and everybody sees the same thing because it's this, this, this four-sided uh, reflection of this graphic fire but they think that they're all seeing a different version of, of the fire and I, I don't like correcting people it's like if that's the meaning you made out of it then who am I to tell you um, okay so we did this again in October at the Hilton we, th we did it a bit different. I hate doing the same project twice, uh, exactly the same. So we had an indigenous storyteller. I mean, it made sense, right? We're in Toronto. And he's basically telling a story and same kind of setup. But we improved on the look of the fire. Uh, we did it in Unity. Um, so we had, uh, how did, so we had MIDI messages being, or was it Oscillator? I think it was Oscillator. We were sending messages from Maxim SP to Unity to control different qualities of the fire, like where wind elements were moving far and closer away, and that's how the fire would move. Uh, we improved on the frame, made it look more rustic, inspired a bit by indigenous art because of our storyteller, of course. Okay, meshi. Meshi means move in Portuguese. I used to live in Brazil, uh, and I was always a big fan of capoeira. So I wanted to kind of tell an abstract story of capoeira with using orishas uh, and wearable tech. The setup was kind of cool. It was at a park, um, Shaw Park, Queen West, and people are sitting around a 360 stage, and everybody has headphones that are wired up, and you the output is sound, so the sensors that some of the dancers are wearing are triggering filters and sudden event sounds. I'm going to show you a sequence of it, and yeah, so you can get a sense of what that show is like. <laughs> So the idea is that that guy with the mask made a 3D printed mask for him. He's, a, he's an Eshu, which is a Orisha, a trickster Orisha, and he represents kind of like the possessed. So none of this is interactive yet, I'll tell you when the sensors actually work. Right, it should be pretty obvious. Technology into the story in a way that makes sense. That doesn't seem patched on. What we wanted to do again with this idea of technology as
So inside of that is the gyroscope again, and it's mapped to the volume of a rain track. See, in this sense, the, the sensor represents uh, humanity, and he's trying to take that away from them by oppressing them. But it's it's kind of like it's like an old movie poem where you have the dung beetle trying to go into the rose garden, but he can't smell smell the scent, and he can't take it. Oh, cut short. But yeah, so it's essentially about how to use sensor art to affect media, uh, visuals, and sound in a meaningful way that helps push the narrative. That's the that's the key. Uh, okay, so that's pretty much my talk on playformance. The next things I'm up to uh, for Subtle Technologies Festival at Gladstone Hotel. I'm doing an opera show where she's gonna be she's gonna be an opera singer in a corset, and she's gonna be on stilts. And as she's moving around on stage with projection mapping graphics to her costume that are being triggered the hue and the speed at which they're playing are being triggered by the modulation of her voice. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it, this is the kind of stuff that I do, because if you're interested in it, I'm always interested to collab with new people. Uh, it takes a lot of, it takes a good strong team to put a show like that on. So if these ideas excite you, uh, get at me and I'd love to hear more about what you do. And, uh, and thanks to DevTO for having me here. Thanks again. It was a camera. It was a, a little webcam. I think it was just like 720. Um, it was basically a rig. I'll tell you about the version that was in the play. So it was basically a rig with a bunch of lights all around it. You had a little webcam right here, and anywhere he would move. It looked a lot like um, that rig they built for Rec Room for a Dream when he's running out of the limo and he's like following him. It looked a lot like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was a little webcam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you get funding? Yeah, good question. Uh, so I was lucky because um, the stuff that I did inspired my director at OCAD and my program. I came from Digital Futures program, which is a new program. We were in the second cohort. And it, of course, when you're a grad student, you've got to know that the better you look, the better they look. So they paid for my talk to Seagraph. They paid for part of the trip to Dubai. So I kept on pushing them for more money. And then I, I documented everything I did. And I had enough clout to get an emerging media artist grant from Toronto Arts Council to do the Capoeira thing. And you just kind of start out small. The, 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 the most lower level, uh, more, more lower hanging fruit that you can get is exhibi exhibition assistance grant from the OAC. That's the first one I got. And then you just kind of frog jump and get more and more. So to answer your question, art grants. Um, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of support from friends, too. Yeah, you. Why Zigbee and not just raw Bluetooth? What's that? Why Zigbee and not just raw Bluetooth? XP? Yeah. I don't know, XP was, was um, it was the most reliable. Yeah, uh, we, we played around with the Bluetooth light for the Capoeira one, it just kept glitching up. It kept glitching up on us. It, it, it was cool that it, the battery lasted long and the thing was tiny, but we had, we had to go with the radio because we, we, we need to trust it every time, you know? Yeah. Let's talk about that more though. Tell me. This would be really interesting to see with that, where a portion of how things are interactive is either audience level participation for brain interaction or artists who do something. So ballet with drawings or, for instance, your glow thing, color changing with mood or color changing with intensity of, uh, of thought or heart rate. Yeah, so, uh, so Muse, I mean, and uh, Neural Sky is super cool. 
if you go on Creators Project, though, it's like you type that in. It's like it's been done to death. You know, I did a project with one where um, so if the user was more focused, it would shoot up. We hacked into a Glade scent sprayer, and the more focused the user would be, it would shoot up the smell of citrus and play this one track. If the more relaxed they would be, it would shoot up lavender. So it's there's a lot of potential. It's super cool. But, and they wanted me to do that for Subtle Technologies, the curator, he was like, do something with the muse, please. I don't know, uh, it's gotta be the right idea. I, I just seen it done to death. As the technology gets better and better, uh, and can actually do what they say it does, because it's pretty noisy, I find, it's pretty noisy. It's hard to really get clean data. What's that? Don't let the artist blink. Yeah, blinking, blinking will do that to you. But it's hard to get clean data out of it. But Maybe I'll revisit it when I got the right idea. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Maziard. And guys, uh, he's he's around for the rest of the evening. If you want to.